every opportunity that we have to come together to sing praises to the name of God, to offer prayers to the throne of God, to kneel uh, before His throne and petition His grace, His love, and His mercy is a wonderful time and a wonderful occasion for us as Christians. We understand the blessing that God has given us, given us on, on this wonderful day. And we understand the fact that there are so many who have not taken advantage of this blessing across our country. There was a time in America when the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday, regardless of who you may have been, what neighborhood you were in, whether you were red, white, black, yellow, polka dot, or pinstripe, it really didn't matter. That folks loved the Lord. They, they worship. We may have disagreed in, in doctrinal, various doctrinal issues and understanding and exegesis of the scripture. But there was a basic understanding that God was in control, that God had blessed this country, and in God we trust. And that for that purpose, uh, people worship, they studied, and they sacrificed, uh, raised their children in the nurture and admonition of, of the Lord. And therefore, we had a generation that saved the world because, uh, in many, many ways, because basically they understand that God had saved them. On this day, I hope as I stand before the greatest people on earth, God's people, that we understand what the Lord was trying to make the woman understand at that well, that Samaritan woman, when the Lord said to her, when she's pointing to the mountains and other traditional landmarks, and the Lord let her know that, that this is not where God is, and that's not what God wants. The Lord said, God is a spirit. There in John chapter 4 and verses 24, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And this is what the Lord said to her on this day, is that the Lord God is looking for those to worship him, who worship him from the heart, who worship him uh, with diligence and with sacrifice and with sincerity. And I hope and pray that as we join together on this wonderful day, that we lift up sacrifice, the sweet smelling savor of awe and reverence and love to our God and our Father in heaven. There was a time when I <clears throat> was a young man, my father, I used to think my father was the bravest man around. My father, when he got home from Korea, he had several jobs. Someone was asking me why I'm often called Nick. All my family calls me Nick. And that's because when uh, my father came home, he had learned various skills. He was a draftsman. He uh, was an engineer. He had learned a lot. And in that particular time in the 50s, a gentleman gave him his first good job. And he wanted to name me Nick after that individual who had the graphics company. My mother was not having it. I was going to be John Jr., so my dad got the last laugh, and he called me Nick, and everybody calls me Nick. Regardless of what's on my birth certificate, folks still call me Nick. But that was a time when he locked up <clears throat> the cemetery. You may have heard me tell this story at PTP. My dad locked up the cemetery every night. That was one of three jobs that he had. And he would go to the cemetery <clears throat> there on Elvis Presley, which is, was called Bellevue at that particular time. And he had a bunch of keys on the side, kind of like Captain Kangaroo. And he would shake those keys as he went inside the gate. And I was a young man, and I would hold on to his britches tight uh, as we went through the cemetery. And he would tell me, Nick, let me go. He, and I, I would let go for a minute, but he would go from mausoleum and all around the cemetery, and I would grab him again. And he said, look, son, there's nobody in here that you need to be afraid of. It's the people outside of here that you need to be afraid of. But he taught me how to drive, driving on the streets of that cemetery <clears throat> in an old 1953 Chevrolet. And with the gears on the side, and he taught me how to pull the gear down and go back up and go back again. And he, for in the beginning, he would handle the gas, and I would learn the clutch. But every now and then, we got ready to start that car and leave the cemetery, and it wouldn't start. <clears throat> he would tell me, Nick, go prime it. 
And I know that the young people don't know what in the world I'm talking about. He would say, go prime the car, and I would take the top off the carburetor, and we kept some gas in the trunk, and I would pour a little bit of gas over in the carburetor and prime it, and the car would start. And you know, when I, the reason I use that analogy so often is because we as Christians can get bogged down by the day-to-day -day fights and battles that we have. And for this reason, every now and then, as Peter and Paul both said to the church, about putting them in remembrance, about stirring them up, about exciting them, about those things that we have to do in the time in which we live. When the Apostle Paul spoke to the brethren at Rome, in Romans chapter 12, that the young man so ably read in your hearing this morning, the Apostle Paul is basically telling them that they've got to get their head in the battle and understand that as soldiers of the cross, as warriors of the truth, that they may have to make some sacrifices of, of themselves and of those things uh, that they love. Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, I beg you, brethren, I implore you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, Paul said, which is your reasonable service. In essence, Paul is saying to the brethren that God shouldn't have to beg you. He shouldn't have to bribe you. God should not have to chase us to save us, but that we present ourselves, our bodies, our intellect, our treasure, our time, our abilities and talents, that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. Then Paul gave us a little bit of advice in verses 2. And especially considering the time in which we live, when the folks, the advertisers and the marketers and the PR people have, have homogenized and pasteurized sin and renamed sin and repackaged sin and represented sin and redesigned and rebranded sin to where sin and the new morality and the progressive agenda of our day has removed the sting, the stench uh, from sin and packaged it and presented it simply as a new way of thinking, a new way of looking at gender, a new way of looking at life, at marriage, at the family, at yourself. Paul said to the brethren in verses 2 of that same chapter, Paul said, be not conformed, be not conformed, be not conformed to this world. Paul said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When we change the way we think, when we change the way we look at things, the world, ourselves, and our brethren, our behavior follows in suit. I remember one time in reading in the Old Testament, and the Scriptures let us know, as Paul and others let us know, that those things written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. God comforts me and gives me hope by letting me look back in the annals of time at those individuals that he has dealt with, that he has empowered, that he has taught, that he has lifted up all during the development of the scheme of redemption, of spiritual nomenclature, as God got us ready for the advent of Jesus Christ, his son. We look back and there was a time that King Saul had sinned, and God said to him, I'm going to find me a better man. I'm going to find a better man, and I'm going to put that better man in charge of my people. He told Saul that neither you nor your sons would rule my people any longer. God sent the old prophet down to Jesse's house, who is uh, um, uh, a descendant of Ruth. And I want you to realize that as he got there, he looks at all of Jesse's fine-looking boys. And he is so impressed by what he sees. He says, surely, now I'm looking at a king of Israel. And God says, no, you're not. I don't want that one. If you don't mind me paraphrasing, I know Zach has probably already quoted it verbatim. But let me, let me paraphrase, if you don't mind, this morning. He says, no, you're not. No, you haven't. That's not the one I want. He said, well, there's another one as pretty as the other one. God says, no, not him either. 
And don't you know that the old prophet got huffy? God, don't you know how wonderful he would look riding down the streets of Jerusalem in a Cadillac chariot? Boy, wouldn't he make us look good. Because the people had already said to God, give us a king so we can be just like everybody else. Doesn't that sound like the anthem of what we see and hear in our nation today? So we can be just like everybody else. I remember my daughter who got married just this past Sunday to a fine young man. I remember when she was seven years old and in Montessori school, and my wife and I came to pick her up from school, and when she got in the car, we said, Christy, I mean, you know, she got in the car and she smelled like the good earth. And we said, Christy, boy, what have you been doing? Uh, you smell bad. And she just laughed. She said, that's okay, Daddy. Everybody in my class thinks. So don't you realize that how, how many of us, as we look around us in the landscape today, how many folks are compromising? Paul said, be not conformed. Jesse was told, I mean, the Samuel, the old prophet was told that day in the house of Jesse. He said, look, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God's not impressed by how well you speak or how well you stand or how good you look or where you were educated or the prefixes and suffixes that are on your name. And I'm not saying don't strive for those things. I love to see our young men and women educated and prepare themselves for the preaching of the gospel and making a living so that they have a worth that and work ethic and nobody has to take care of them, they take care of themselves. I love to see that, but at the same time, that's not what impresses God. God said to the old prophet at that particular time, he said, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And God's examining every one of our hearts, which is why Paul said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When the Hebrew writer wrote to those brethren, I told you this morning in Hebrew chapter 5 and verses 12, where he said to them that by when time when they ought to be teachers, masters, that word teachers in that context comes from a term which means masters. He's saying you ought to be tougher than this now. You ought to be smarter than this. You should have been ready. You should have already, a soldier that's already gone through basic training and he knows his job and he's been trained on his weapon and he's been trained on his equipment. And then when time comes for him to fight, he acts as though he doesn't know anything. Paul is saying to the brethren, it's, you, you shouldn't be in that kind of shape when the war starts. He says, you're acting like those who need milk and not meat. In essence, what every one of us must keep in mind is that God expects us to prepare ourselves for the stand. The Word of God is quick and powerful. It's alive and dynamic, sharper than a two-edged sword or two-mouthed sword. It eats like Brother Keeble used to say, it cuts coming and it cuts going. And he says, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It cuts down to the joints and to the mind. We can't fool God. We might be able to lie to ourselves. We may be able to lie to our friends and colleagues. We might even be able to lie to our family and loved ones, but you cannot lie to God because God knows the thoughts and intents of our heart. Jeremiah said in the book of Jeremiah chapter 10 and verses 23, Jeremiah said, Oh Lord, oh Lord, looking at the children of Israel in their apostasy, their disobedience, the children of Israel wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. They weren't lost. They weren't lost. They were disobedient. And because they were disobedient, God gave them a delusional walk to where they walked in circles until all of them that defied and disobeyed him were buried in the wilderness. This is why as Jeremiah looked at the descendants of these individuals, he said, oh Lord, oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. In essence, we need revelation. 
because truth is not innate within us now. Make no mistake about it. When God made the animals, he made them living creatures. They were given instinctive motivation to act within their nature as God instinctively gave them that ability. But we were given intelligence. God gave us intelligence and reason and intuitiveness. Then God gave us law. He gave us law. And gave us the ability to decide between two sides. That's why the majority of the Bible is written in comparative language. God compares that which is good with that which is bad. That which is righteous with that which is unrighteous. Those things that strengthen and build and enlighten and give vision with those things that destroy and deter and damage and blind. And God gave us the intelligence and then gave us free agency. He gave us free moral agency to where we can make a decision for ourselves. And in doing so, Jeremiah says, basically, we need revelation. I need God to tell me what he wants from me and how he wants me to live. When Paul was talking to the brethren uh, through Titus, Titus had been left at Crete. Timothy had been left at Ephesus. And in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and verses 12, as Paul talked to this young preacher, understanding what he's got to go through, he wanted him to tell folks, the Lord wants y'all to be saved. The Lord wants each of you to go to heaven. The Lord wants all of you to have an opportunity uh, to hear him say, well done. Paul said, Titus, you tell them the grace of God that bring it salvation has appeared unto all men, everybody. Nobody can say, God didn't tell me. You're not going to stand at the judgment day and make God feel bad. God said, I'm not going to play that with you. I'm not going to play that with you. There are some folks who are thinking, well, I'm going to go. I'm going to tell God it was because of my race. It was because of my gender. It was because of the part of town I grew up in. It was because my mama was on crack and my daddy was in jail. Or my father was too busy traveling in Europe to raise me. Or all the excuses that folks got in their heads about what they're going to tell God when God has made the truth available to each and every one of us. And the scriptures let us know, as Peter tells us very clearly, God's not willing. He's not willing. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God says, no, I'm not going to play that with you. You're not going to come on the judgment day and point a finger at me as though I didn't do my job to save you. So Paul told Titus, you tell those folks that the grace of God that bring it salvation has appeared unto all men. Doing what, Paul? Teaching us. What, Paul? Teaching us. Teaching us. All scripture came by inspiration of God. God breathed, inspired this word. So I would know the difference between the holy and the profane, right and wrong, so I can make a good decision for myself, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. In other words, the Lord says, nope, I, have, I will give you all that you need. All things that pertain to life and godliness, I'm going to put them in that word. All you need so you can study or be diligent and show yourself approved, I'm going to put it in this word. All you need so that you can compare and find out what is true, I'm going to put it in this word. So Paul said that you can live soberly. That's your responsibility to yourself. As I mentioned this morning, as Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8, about being sober and vigilant, Paul uses that same word Peter uses. In other words, be sober, soberly. My responsibility to myself, be sober. Don't get drunk, intoxicated, inebriated with pride, with the love of this world, with materialism, with pleasure, to where I lose my sobriety because I'm so drunk 
with the things of this world. Jesus said to us when he preached that wonderful sermon, when he sat on the mountaintop with the acoustics of the Sea of Galilee behind him, as he spoke to the people, he said to them very clearly, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. I can't stand a thief. He said that thieves break through and steal. He said, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt nor thieves break through and steal. Why, Lord? He said, because where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. In essence, the Lord said, if you're going to love me and understand something about the Lord, he equates love with obedience. Don't say, Lord, I love you, but I can't do what you tell me. Oh, yeah, Lord, I love you, but I, I can't stand that word you said. Oh, yeah, Lord, I, I love you, but now uh, um, I, 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 I've chosen a different lifestyle. Lord says, no, I don't play that. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's just that simple. Don't tell me you love me if you refuse to obey me. So Paul said to the brethren, the word of God has taught us how to live soberly. My responsibility to myself, nobody can decide to save me but me. God's not going to save you without your consent. And he's not going to save you without your participation. God's not going to walk and pop you upside your head and drag you kicking and screaming to heaven. It's not going to happen. You're going to go to heaven because you decide to go there. Because you've made a decision to follow Jesus, like the song says, no turning back, no turning back. So your sobriety has to do with you deciding, just as the apostles taught those folks on the day of Pentecost, that same bunch of murderous liars who had taken the life of God's Son, when they were standing there and all of a sudden it hit them when he pricked them in their heart with the knife of truth. And they began to scream, men, brethren, what can we do? What can we possibly do? What can possibly mitigate the terrible sin where we have the blood of the Son of God on our hands? You know what he told them? He didn't say, y'all old wretched, no count, lying, uh, murderers and killers, don't even come in my face. No. He said, repent, 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 repent. Be baptized, bury your old man, be, repent, be baptized. In the name of Jesus, the same one you killed, his blood will mitigate this terrible sin. And you know what else he told them during this narrative as Peter preached the gospel? He said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. When we go to Matthew chapter 16, when the Lord came to the apostles, when we think about sobriety and making decisions for ourselves, he came to the apostles and he said to them, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? What are they saying about me out there in the marketplace? What are y'all hearing about me among the Sanhedrin? What are y'all hearing about me among the elders, among the regular people, among the folks as they go back and forth buying their bread and their fish every day? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they began to say, some say you're John the Baptist or Jeremiah or, or one of those old dead prophets. But you know what Jesus did to them on, at that moment is the same thing he does to each of us to smack us back into sobriety. He said, who do you say I am? What say you, Peter? What say you, John? What say you, James? Who do you say that I am? And he asked each and every one of us when the world constantly is telling us that Jesus is not the Son of God that he's a fraud and a fake and the figment of somebody's imagination, and that the Word of God is an old Bronze Age book that ought to be discarded and removed from the marketplace. The Lord is saying to each of us, trying to bring us back to sobriety as Christians, who do you say? In other words, when they say that Jesus is not the Son of God, what do you say? When they say that he was not real, what do you say? 
When they say the Bible was not inspired, what do you say? What say ye? On one of his better days, Peter stood up like a man and he spoke in a way that all of us as Christians could be proud of our brother Peter on that day. Peter said, you're the Christ. You're the Christ. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said to Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood. You didn't get this from the marketplace. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee. And I say that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, this fact, this bedrock truth, that I am the Son of God, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, a few days in the Hadean realm, when they kill this body, I'm going to get up again. The gates of hell should not prevail against it. And he says, and I say that thou art Peter. Thou art Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church. In other words, he's saying, Peter, I'm going to build my church upon the truth that I am the son of God. And then he did something else. He gave them legislative authority. He said, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He gave the apostles legislative authority because they were going to be the most powerful men that have ever lived. Moses and Abraham and Elijah and others had done wonders and signs. Moses split the Red Sea. But the apostles had the baptismal measure of the Holy Ghost. These men, the Lord says, I will give you the authority so that the things that you say when you speak, you speak for me. So when Paul was speaking for the Lord there in Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12, when he said the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, that's the foundation principle. I've got to tell the devil, no, no, no. Take personal responsibility. John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Why, John? Because all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. John said, why would you love those things? Why? Love not the world. And so when he's telling us that we should deny ungodliness. He's telling us to love not the world. Our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, on one occasion when he asked all of us a sobering question, he said, what do you profit? What do you profit? Come on, he said, sit down, let me talk to you. Let me get to your pure mind. Let me get to the foundation of your best self. He says, what do you profit? If you should gain the whole world and lose your soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The Lord is saying, what's the price of your sellout? So when the devil come to you, and then you know I want to give the style of the devil some slick mafia guy with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and his cap turned, hat turned sideways with a hand full of money and a pinstripe suit and a gold chain on the side. When the devil say, what's the price of your sellout? What do I have to give you so you'll stop living for God, stop preaching the truth, stop raising your children right, stop being honest and just and merciful? What do I have to give you so you'll stop worshiping that guy named Jesus? You know he's a fake and a fraud. What do I have to do to keep you home on Sunday, to have you go playing golf or doing something at the mall rather than listening either in person or electronically to what Jesus wants? What what's the price of your sellout? Well, what's the price of your sellout? What I got to give you? Tell me, just give me the price. I can give it to you. You know he'll offer it to you if he'll offer it to Jesus. You realize the devil tried to bribe Jesus? Now, if he tried to bribe the Son of God, who are you? That's nothing special about you. He offered the same thing, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life to the Son of God. And he comes to each of us with the same trifecta, which has never failed him but one time, and that was with Jesus. That's why the Lord says, what have you profited? If you gain the whole world, what's the whole world? Flesh, eye, pride. You got it all. And you lost your soul 
or you lost yourself. He says, what have you profited? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So when the Apostle Paul says this to the brethren, live soberly, righteously, righteously. That's your responsibility to your brother, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your family, to your church family. Soberly, righteously, your responsibility to your brother. Lord's not going to come and say, okay, bring, bring your checkbook, bring your, bring your portfolio, bring your investments, uh, bring uh, the record of your offerings, uh, the number of baptisms you've had, the number of sermons. Lord is not going to ask for any of that. As a matter of fact, he says, I'm not even looking for the wise and the well-born and the people who think I ought to be looking to him, looking for them. That's why the rich young ruler walked off sad because the Lord says, uh, it says, if you want to impress me, boy, and you come in here with your nose up in the air, want me to look at your Armani robe, he says, you go sell what you got and give it to the poor. Then you come back and talk to me. So the Lord is saying to all of us, he said to us, there are going to be many that come to me in that day who didn't understand what righteousness was. And they're going to say, Lord, didn't we do this and that? Didn't I give this and that? Wasn't I able to do? Lord, have you looked at my resume, my dossier, and my record? Lord, let me bring it for you to look at it so you'll be impressed. Lord, say, I'm going to say, get out of my face. What do you mean, Lord? Do you know who I am? Yes, I know, who, I know exactly who you are, and we were never close. I never knew you. He says, I was hungry. You didn't feed me naked. You didn't clothe me. I was sick. In other words, I sent you the least, the last, the little, and the lost to save them, and you refused to do so. I'm not talking about uh, handing out and the church becoming some social agency. I'm talking about teaching men those things that they need to know to change their lives so that they'll take care of themselves and take care of their own. The Lord said, you didn't do that. He says, depart from me, for you are a worker of iniquity, that you didn't teach the people who you had the opportunity to teach. You didn't uphold the truth. You didn't fight for me in the eyes of men who needed to see you let your light shine because shining your light glorified me. You didn't help them. I didn't need you trying to, to give this and give that all the time. Do what's right. You know what's right. He says what I needed you to do was give them the proper example. I needed you to lift up my cross. I told you if I be lifted up from the earth, I, not you, I will draw all men unto me. And I told you that. And he says, that's what righteousness is. And godly, my responsibility to my God and my Father in heaven. Trust in the Lord, the prophet said. Lean not on your own understanding. One of these days, Jesus Christ is coming back. One of these days, God's going to say, to his son, go get my people. The Lord already said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He said, in my father's house, there in John 14 and verses 1, are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, for you. He says, and if I go, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Let me tell y'all something, a news flash in case we didn't get it. This is not our home. This is not our home. We are a colony of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are colonies on a, a colony on foreign land. God wants us to understand we are pilgrims and sojourners in this world. This world is not my home. And for this reason, I understand I can't stay. I don't care what you acquire, what you accumulate, what you hoard, what you bank, what you hide, what you do. You know, all of us are going to leave this world and turn into a yard sale because it doesn't matter what you have accumulated in life. The Lord wants us to understand this is not home. So what do we do? We conduct ourselves in such a way that when our ride comes and the Lord's going to be doing the driving on our, and our ride's going to come, 
When my ride comes, I want to catch the ride. I don't want to be left standing at the bus stop. When God sends Jesus to get his children on that cloud, and the Lord drives that heavenly vehicle down, and we're supposed to meet him in the air, I want to be there, don't you? I don't want to have a moment where I'm thinking, did I fix this, and did I fix that, and did I change this, and did I change that, and did I repent of this, and did I get rid of this, and did I stop this? This is why, as, as I conclude this morning, the Apostle Paul, as he spoke to the brethren at Ephesus, he gave them this advice, and I want you to take this before I sit down. He said, that you put off. Concerning the former conversation, Paul said, the old man, which is, a, is corrupt because of deceitful lust. And Paul said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Change your thinking. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, Paul said, and in true Holiness. James tries to tell us in James 4 and verses 4, don't get too friendly with the world because friendship with the world makes you an adversary or puts you in an adversarial relationship with God. It's pure and simple. We want to go home. This is not our home. We want to go to heaven. Jesus has prepared the house. God is waiting on us and the day will come that he will come as a thief in the night. If I have heard the truth, as I said this morning, the greatest story ever told about the greatest life ever lived. And it has impressed me to the point that I do personal examination and I realize that I'm missing the mark. As Paul said in Romans 3.23, that I have sinned. As Paul told the brethren at Philippi, that I am missing the mark and I'm not pressing toward the goal. I am not standing. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 58, I'm not steadfast and unmovable. Then I need to change some things because my faith, as I accept that the things written in this book are true, I'm going to see that obviously some of the things that I have lived by are not true. So I'm going to repent of my sins. I'm going to say to God, I get it. I get it. You don't have to put me down like you did Nadab and Abihu. You don't have to strike me dead the way you did Ananias and Sapphira. You don't have to put me, my, me and mine down the way you did Achan or the way you did in the antediluvian era in Noah's day. No, Father, I repent right now because I got sense enough to see that I'm the one wrong. And I'm going to change my life. That's a decision that you make. It is volitional. God's not going to force you. He's not going to beg you. He's not going to chase you. He has prepared too wonderful a table and a place for us for eternity where there's no sickness, no sorrow, no death, no pain, no medicine, no virus, no inoculation, no vaccine, none of the foolishness that we see happening today in our environment. And you don't have to wear a face mask in heaven. So what, what is God saying? Repent. Repent. Acknowledge that my son is the son of God. Bury your old man in the watery grave. And the word resurrection means to stand up again. I have fallen to sin. I stand up again and walk in the newness of life. If you've fallen away, that's why the story of the prodigal was given. God is the father. The prodigal was the perfect repentant. Why perfect repentant? Because you couldn't mess up much worse than he did. He finds himself a Jew about to fill his belly with the husk that the pigs were going to eat. I played football, and some of you may have also. And I remember a time when I was going to tackle a guy. He dropped his head on me, Zach. And when I woke up, they were snapping those little caps of ammonia under my nose, trying to wake me up. And I believe that that boy had a handful of that maggot-filled garbage and the ammonia and stench of it knocked his head back and he looked and said, what in the world am I doing? In my father's house, there's food. In my father's house, there's uh, I can be clean. I can wear clothes. I can be among family. Let me return to my father's house. That's why the Lord told that story. He's saying, you can't get too dirty, too far, too stinky, that I can't clean you, straighten you up, and make you happy again as my child. 
so you repent of it. Acknowledge it and ask God for forgiveness. Heaven too, too wonderful to miss, y'all. Uh, hell is too terrible and it wasn't even made for you. We can go to heaven. We can rejoice together. And all of this stuff, all we got to do right now is take courage from the Lord, his apostles, and our brothers and sisters who lived 2,000 years ago. Follow their example. Be encouraged by it. And this is our time. It's our time. And we do our job just like they did their job. And the Lord will take you home. He says, I'll wipe away every tear. I give you a body that don't age, don't wear out. And I will put you in the light and the blessedness and the holy, holiness of God. Won't you consider it?